The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. You're listening to Wrestling to the Max. Alert, alert, clear all channels. This is an exclusive pay-per-view review. How you like that? And your host, Gary Vaughn, Sean Garmer, and Paul Wieser. Welcome, everybody, to Wrestling to the Max special edition of Pay-Per-View Reviews. And I do mean reviews, because we're not just doing one tonight. We are actually doing two. We're going to start tonight with NXT TakeOver Toronto. That's right. We haven't got into it in full in depth yet, so we're going to be getting into that. Plus, we are talking Survivor Series 2016. It is going to be an interesting one. I'm excited about this show. I hope you are, too. I am your host, Gary Vaughn, along with me for this big ride, of course, Mr. Sean Garmer. What's up, everybody? And Mr. Paul Leeser. hey yo. And boy, man, we have a great show coming your way. We're going to get into both of these pay-per-view shows that were both available on the WWE Network. But before we let you know all about those, we want to let you guys know, go check us out on W2Mnet.com. Not only do you have our roundtable for both of these shows, but you also have some other shows that we like to review. Of course, that also means other shows other than WWE. So go check all that stuff out. Plus, There's a takeover hey, review, too. Yeah, exactly. So great stuff. You guys want to go and uh, definitely read. I'm sure if you have not checked it out, you want to go see if we were wrong or right when we predicted things. Uh, also, don't forget, hey, if you're looking for great podcasts, maybe this is the first time you're looking for us, go to the W2M Network. That's the place you go subscribe. That's the place that you're going to get every piece of content that we have available for you guys on the download so I'll be looking forward to that. But, you know, we've got a great uh, set of shows to talk about here. So let's get this thing kicked off right. Let's go ahead and start by talking NXT TakeOver Toronto. Well, I'm dumb. This, this <laughs> is always great where I do this, where I forget to actually put the... Uh... Don't you forget to put the song in? I got it in. I just, now I I didn't take the time to figure out where the chorus is, so I'm just gonna put a guess here, and we're just gonna play this. Hey, it'll be fun anyway. All righty, guys. Uh, well, now we are going to start this thing off by talking about the biggest match on this card, or at least for a lot of people. They're really interested in seeing who is going to come out victorious between Shinsuke Nakamura and Samoa Joe. And this was for the NXT title. And we expected a very violent match, and at times it was very violent. Uh, but, you know, guys, uh, we had Samoa Joe walking out as the champion, which was kind of interesting to me. I had predicted that Shinsuke Nakamura would be the victor here and retain his title. Not the way it worked out. How would you feel about this all, Paul? I think we all actually picked Shinsuke to walk out with the championship. So they go the complete other direction, uh, which is a bit of a head-scratcher to me. I don't want to discount the match. It's very good. Um, you know, it's not the best on the show. Now, I wouldn't even say second best on the show, honestly, but... Still very good, very hard hitting. I enjoyed the finish a lot. I thought what they did with Joe here really made sense. Uh, as far as how they had him win, I'm still, I'm just kind of, where do you go? I mean, obviously there has to be a third match now, and I kind of hope it's last man standing. But we, there's been a lot of talk that they're going to do a cage match out in Australia for the championship now too. So I'm, uh, I'm scratching my head here, guys. What do you guys think? Well, they do also have a match in Japan, I think too. So, uh, you know, it could be either one of those shows. They could flip off them on those shows, for all we know. Uh, or it could just, that's going to happen on a house show and we don't see any of it. 
So uh, they've been kind of weird about that sometimes where we do get to see it and sometimes we don't. Uh, perhaps this is all just freeing up Shinsuke so that he's ready to go for, you know, Royal Rumble time. Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't have that flip-flop the title back. Or perhaps this is having Joe get that big win so he still looks strong and then you have Shinsuke win and Joe's the one that shows up in the Royal Rumble. We don't know. Um... I mean, let's be honest, both those guys really don't need to be there at this point. If we're being honest with ourselves and honest about... Like, we... I think we all know that it's... WWE cares about the touring brand thing, but they do also need people uh, to be on the main roster for both brands, and having both those guys would be, be huge for either brand or one brand or... You'd have to think that they split them up, but yeah, uh, this match was much better than the uh, the first one, uh, so that's uh, plus. Uh, did Joe just really, really work on that leg? Even though, you know, at, at this point, if you've watched the Shinsuke match, you know he's not always the best person about selling uh, a body part, and that kind of continues here. He still did okay with it, just you know, not what you'd expect from a body part that was almost massacred by Joe. <laughs> and, I mean, like, literally, he... Like, you know, people talk about the whole... How they don't have to sell like that body part was shot off with a shotgun. He basically did everything but that. Uh, and, you know, you didn't get that here. So that's kind of one of those times where I don't think I'm nitpicking. I think it's just... It, it is what it is. But still, like, like everything that Paul said, this match was... Really good. I have it as my second best match on the show. Uh, I really enjoyed it and glad that we got something to the caliber that we know these guys can deliver. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, you come out of this really wondering the future of this feud. You know, how far are they going to go? How is this going to take place? And also those same questions you guys brought up of, you know, when are these guys going to be hitting the main roster? Uh, you know, and, you know, with the Royal Rumble coming our way very quickly here. It does make you wonder if one or the other is going to take a different direction, and maybe the NXT title stays on one guy while the other travels. Uh, and so we'll see. Um, but you know, once again, not a bad match. It, it was, you know, I, I think there's other matches though I was really enthralled in, maybe compared to this one, but still pretty good stuff. Uh, you know, I'm going to switch around here. I don't think we really have to go in order. I, I want to mention this because it kind of ties in with uh, this main event. And what I mean by that is the entrances. And if you watch Shinsuke Nakamura walk in, once again, he had, of course, the violin players. I even get the ring with him, which I thought Samoa Joe was going to clean the house. Uh, <laughs> violin players. That didn't happen, though. Uh, but talking about entrances, uh, the glorious one himself, Mr. Bobby Roode, had a giant entrance with a great choir come out and sing along with his entrance and I thought that was kind of fun. I thought it was a great you know, way to kind of start the show. Um, and of course his competitor uh, was Ty Dillinger. So they had a pretty interesting bout here uh, and of course Ty Dillinger does lose to Bobby Roode but not you know, by the, you know, the crowd's reaction. The crowd still loved the perfect 10. What do you think, Sean? Oh, this was really, really good. I enjoyed this a heck of a lot. I mean, uh, for an opener, this was uh, terrific. Uh, the crowd obviously likes both guys being Canadian, uh, so this was a great way to start the show. Uh, you had, And the crowd actually played along, which is great. You didn't have the whole, oh, Bobby Roode is obviously a bigger star than Ty Dillinger. We all got to root for him. You did get Bobby Roode chance, whatever, but you got Bobby Roode sucks chance. You got everybody just loving the 10 thing. Uh, the funny part is they chanted the 10 for the count out and all that kind of stuff. For the 10 punch, they didn't chant 10 the whole time. They actually counted the numbers, which was funny because the one time that the full cell crowd, the crowd always chants just 10 constantly is when he does the 10 punch thing. So um, that's interesting. And then, of course, that would carry on uh, throughout we saw it on Raw in the main event, and we also saw it uh, heavily in Survivor Series as well. The whole uh, the crowd decided that 10 was going to be this this big, huge thing. 
I don't know if that's going to translate to next to uh, wherever they're at on SmackDown and, of course, next week in, in Charlotte, if that becomes the new what or yes or whatever, or if that's just because, you know, they know Ty's Canadian and they want to just put him over. But, uh, you know, this is uh, – it was just really good. Uh, you had some good back and forth with both guys, and you had some just – it was entertaining all throughout, and you really felt for Ty when he lost. And I think that means that they accomplished what they what they wanted to do here. I absolutely loved this match. I think it's being severely underrated everywhere mm-hmm. I've looked as far as reviews goes. Like I think this is a four star match. It is the very definition of an old school brawl played out to perfection by two veterans who have been around for a very long time. This is one of the best matches I've ever seen Bobby Roode in. It's certainly the best match I've seen Ty Dillinger in. These guys went out there and absolutely put on a show. I They couldn't have picked a better match to open, in my opinion. This was so, so good. And I, uh, this this was the second best match on the card for me. I, I enjoyed this match so much. Yeah, it, definitely. And, you know, it was a, you know, just a spectacular way to get everything kicked off here. I really appreciated just in general, not only what worked out in the ring, but also, like I said, the way they just gave this entrance of, you know, excitement and just, uh, I don't know. It, it was almost like, a, you know, the old school Ric Flair, you know, where it takes forever for the guy to get to the ring, but you, you're so happy to see him. That's kind of the way I felt about Bobby Roode. And, of course, they did not disappoint at all when him and Ty Dillinger went at it. And, you know, Ty Dillinger comes out of this still looking great. He really does. Um, of course, you know, his personal reaction is disappointment, but I think the crowd loved him. And I think also, man, you know, he did so much, even in a loss, to prove, man, he is just still uh, one great, you know, wrestler. Uh, let's hop on over and talk about another championship match that happened on this card, and that is the women's championship match with Asuka trying to retain her title against Mickey James, who has not been part of the WWE or NAWB ring for, I think they said, six years. So this is really interesting. Um, I'll say this, guys. It was a lot of fun to watch. I really, really enjoyed this match as well. I think that, you know, they did a really good job of getting Mickey James to show that she's the veteran and that maybe Asuka is not as good as maybe she thinks she is, but Asuka still proves to be amazing. I, I think they just really knocked this one out of the park compared to my honest thoughts beforehand. I didn't really think this was going to go over as well as it did. Mickey James looks great. Asuka looks great. It, it was definitely a great match. But Asuka does retain her title in the end. What do you think about it, Paul? I thought this was solid. I th- I didn't really know what to expect from the two, uh, just because I wasn't sure if they were going to mesh well or not. And they certainly did. I think they told a really good story throughout, too, with with each one sort of trying to one-up each other throughout the match. And you get some really sick spots out of it, too. The stuff on the outside with, uh, with the kicks and everything and, and the suplexes I thought was great. The sort of uh, letting each other come back in the ring only for Asuka to sort of cut her off there. That was awesome, too. And Asuka just... Sort of getting almost disrespectful at the end whenever, instead of shaking the hand, she just holds up the belt. So I, I'm looking forward to who challenges her next, whether it's somebody from actual next year, if they have to bring in another big star. But uh, I mean, this was still really, really good. And the kicks, of course, off the charts. Yeah, and what I definitely loved about this too, Sean, was the fact that, you know, really this is the first time that Oscars look really vulnerable. I mean, Mickey James really did a good job. And, of course, I think Oscar sold it very well of, you know, she could have tapped out any minute. Mm-hmm. She could have. Uh, I think uh, I see a lot of people complaining about they gave Mickey too much and like, oh, why are you doing this for an outside person and not somebody on your own roster or whatever? But uh, I think people need to just hush. Like, this is not the Goldberg situation. Uh, this is somebody that was with the company for many years before. Uh, it's not somebody that came in for one year or one and done or even like Brock that has his ups and downs of with the company like you know six time women's champion I mean she should be going to the, I, it's just, she could still wrestle today it's not like she's coming in like over for a, oh you know I'm a never was or whatever um 
she can still go out there and, and do her thing, and she proved that, and that was part of it too. She was trying to prove, she was definitely proving to Oscar that hey, you don't don't take don't make sure you take me seriously because I, I can I can you know go toe to toe with you, and that was her thing. She proved it. I mean, she had her moments there where she could have won. I mean that uh, the Mick kick was that was still pretty cool to see her doing, and. Uh, you know, Oscar was was great in this too, and like you said, you finally got to see her a little bit vulnerable. Oscar, of course, I, I think you should expect what we got at the end there with Oscar being prideful about the fact that I'm still the dominant woman in this division. I just my my thing. This kind of came off too a little bit anticlimactic, very much like uh, the Bailey, the first Bailey match at uh, Takeover Dallas. Mm-hmm. Uh, where she immediately puts in the damn chokehold and she taps it. And it's like, oh, I really wish there would have been a little bit of like, oh, she could get to the ropes, oh, not, or or have Asuka like pull her arm away or something to make it definitive. Like, I just, it really kind of left a sour taste in my life. Like, oh, man, after all that, okay. It's like, I get it, like, her move is lethal or whatever, but this kind of, it bothered me a little bit. Yeah, fair enough. And, you know, uh, at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, this to me, like I said, it, it ended up being better than I expected. Um, you know, and people that don't like, you know, the fact that Mickey James was given all that. I mean, Sean had a great point. She's a veteran. She's been here before. And I love that part of the storyline that, you know, she's seen it all. And so there's nothing that Oscar is going to throw her away that she hasn't at least experienced once or twice. So I think that was a great point to add to this. And maybe shows that, uh, that Oscar can be beat. We just haven't seen it yet. Uh, but let's move on to some of these tag team matches. Let's start with the Dusty Rhodes Classic Tag Team Finale. And this includes the Authors of Pain and TM61. And guys, I mean, the Authors of Pain, uh, they had a situation where their manager um, was basically put in a cage above the ring um so which you know also that structure would be used in this match was kind of fun as well so there you go in the end though the authors of pain are victorious and you know i I think this was solid guys i really thought it was you know maybe not one of the best matches but it was it was solid i think both teams did a good job what do you think paul yeah uh I thought this was fine. The, the, I was really surprised that they let, uh, you know, uh, was it Shane or oh, no, it was Nick Miller who did the uh, the dive off the, the freaking crane. Like that came out of nowhere. <laughs> and uh, that sort of gets you into the match. And then they sort of sort of go through the rest. Uh, I don't want to say going through the motions, but it certainly felt like that at times. But this was still good. Like, I, I think it might be the best we've seen the authors of pain look. I, I'm still waiting for TM61 to really find something that lets them stick out and gain some real some real heat because so far they still feel like guys and not really like the mighty don't kneel yet, you know? Agreed. They do feel like guys. Um, and, you know, the authors of pain are not the most over heels either to be uh, having them go against where you do feel for them. I think... It depends on how long the Revival are going to be around, and you know they're going to get their obligatory rematch. Mm -hmm. Do they let the Revival stick around to kind of see if they can give TM61 a little rub uh, before they go? Because they do kind of have a little bit... They've had simmering tension for a while between the two teams that never totally got resolved, I think. Um, so that could be helpful because if there's a team that can really get you behind somebody, it's facing the Revival, and TM61 might need that before the Revival leave. I mean, if they do, they, they may not. But, uh, I, I mean, I think that's a way that, that could help TM61, certainly. Uh, they just, you know, they don't have the that charisma chemistry. I mean, we like I said, I've said many times that we got to see them be funny. Uh, and we got to see them show a little bit of personality, but they need something else, too. Um, they are kind of coasting on the whole, hey, we're from Japan, you should know us. And they they don't come off as the big stars that, that we sh- if you haven't watched them before, you don't really care about them. And, uh, you know, they, they need to do something to change that. 
uh, for them, especially since you're, they're going to be part of your tag, standard tag team uh, guys for a while, you know, if their rival do leave. So you need them to sort of be over. Mm-hmm. Um, the match was fine. I didn't think, other than that big spot that Paul mentioned, which that crane thing was not attached to that cage, by the way. Uh, but uh, even though Tom Phillips wanted to let you know that, uh, I, eh, other than that, there really wasn't anything just totally blow away for this. I did love the fact that they brought back uh, that cage deal and they used old footage to show you that they have done that before in previous wrestling organizations or whatever. That's that's really cool. It's those, those little touches where you can use the network. Uh, it, it's nice. Uh, definitely, and you know, uh, it was great to see that we didn't have any kind of silly things where Paul Eldering was able to get out of the cage or anything like that, you know, or do something, you know, completely out of this world. At least this was a straight up match, and the authors of Pain, you know, actually got to look vulnerable as well in this match, but they still, at the end of the day, dominated and found their way to that victory. And so there they go, um, and classy stuff at the end, you know. Uh, moving on to our final match that we're going to get into on this card, at least. Uh, well, let's talk about the two out of three falls NXT championship match that took place between the Revival, who were trying to retain their championships, against DIY. And, of course, that involves Johnny Gargano and my buddy, Tommaso Ciampa. Uh, and, boy, this was a lot of fun. I mean, a, a Solid match as well. I really had a lot of fun watching this. So, so did Ciampa still carry this thing, Gary? Ciampa still carries... Ciampa carries everyone. I mean, <laughs> the revival owe him a debt of gratitude for helping them along as well. Uh, so, <laughs> this is my personal opinion. But at the end of the day, guys, I, I really had a fun time watching this. We actually have new tag team champions, though, in NXT because DIY does pull it off. And they find a way to get the victory. I, I don't know, Sean. I mean, how did you feel at the end of the day? Oh, this was great. This was a match of the year candidate. Uh, it's a five-star match. It was absolutely awesome. Uh, I, I don't know, you know, amazing, whatever you want to put it. Uh, Tommaso Ciampa certainly did not care everyone in this match. But, you know, Gary is allowed to have his fun. Uh is Johnny Gargano was tremendous as the face in peril here as he always is and just the people love him even in Canada the people were loving on on Johnny wrestling uh their revival again they're just they're just so so great at what they do and I think once again like how can anyone uh, I mean look let's I'm gonna be honest here I we can't watch everything and the people that do that have the time and your only passion in life is wrestling power to you, you know, cool. That's great guys. But my whole life doesn't revolve around wrestling. I I love wrestling, but I'm not going to sit here and try to say that some, in some dingy Japanese, like any promotion, there's this great tag team that nobody's ever heard of. That's out doing the revival. The revival for me Every single time they go out there and they absolutely just kill it. They absolutely outdo themselves. They already had a freaking match, the candidate match with DIY last time. And they somehow were able to outdo themselves again. And it's it's amazing what we're seeing from a tag team. They did this with American Alpha. They do it again with... Well, DIY, just, this is awesome, and it's just, we, we need to take this in, you know, you drink in the gift of the revival, because it's not always going to be around. Yeah, I, I don't know if I could say it any better, but, I, I mean, call Uncle Dave and the Young Bucks, because this one does indeed deserve five stars. Uh, th- that is the only way they're going to be able to top their last match, and they, they went out there and found the formula to do it. Johnny Wrestling... I love the ending of the first fall because Tommaso looks at Johnny after he takes that first fall. Like, are you serious? Is this happening to us again? Comes in and whoops the revival for the second fall. And then you, you get a whole bunch of great stuff leading up to the third, which, which Gargano gets the big pin for. And it's incredible. And everybody's I'm crying. 
I'm sure I'm sure everybody at home was crying. I I mean, if you follow uh, if you follow Candice LeRae on Twitter, she was having a freaking freak out moment in a public place because she she just got to watch Johnny win the freaking tag belts, and it's it's so so well deserved for DIY. And I I mean, I'm with you, Sean. There's no better tag team on this or any other planet in the universe who wrestles better than the Revival. They are the absolute best. Briscoes, Young Bucks, Red Dragon. There's a lot. Of Yuji, uh, Yuji Okabayashi and, and Daisuke Sakamoto over in Japan. Amazing tag teams. They are not on the Revival's level right now. I mean, Big and this was totally out of the the like NWA playbook of just Southern wrestling match. Mm-hmm. Just played so well. Um, I uh, it this is tag team action at perfection. Just. Yeah, yeah. It, it it doesn't get any better. The, the the revival on the big stage have not had a match below four and a quarter star like that. That is ridiculous. And they they've been on some big stages this year, and they've performed up to the level every single time. Yeah, I definitely agree with you guys. I mean, it, it is the truth. The revival is one of the best things going in NXT in general, and. Uh, even in the world of wrestling, this is one of our favorite tag teams, and that says a lot. And these guys are awesome. I think we all want to see them go and move on to a major brand in WWE. We just hope they get treated well. Yeah, so. exactly. That, that's the point, though. Like, are they going to be able to have the... Like, that's the thing that kind of upsets me is on SmackDown, they're trying, right? Like, you have guys now now if they go to smackdown definitely you know you they could redo the american alpha or whatever um but like you have guys that just like what we saw with the women where the women are now finally starting to have these matches that can resemble what we got in nxt maybe it's going to take some time and that's fine but if you're going to have the revival up there please let them be the revival and and let them have these matches that we know they can have and give them the time because if you do you're not going to regret it. Yeah. I mean they're the top guys for a reason and if you don't let them be them uh, or anything at all resembling what they have been here in NXT, you're doing them a disservice and you're doing wrestling a disservice. And I know that's probably not something WWE's too worried about right now, but they have a, a, pa- a pair of big tag team stars that they can hang their hat on for years to come and, and Dash and Dawson here. And if they do, if they do them wrong, then I, I don't, there's no hope for tag team wrestling in WWE. Oh, and Gargano and Champa too, if they ever get to come up and, and still be a tag team, I mean, it's possible they could split them up in their singles guys too, which they'll work just fine as singles guys. But, uh, you know, it will, you have those guys along with American Alpha, and uh, I can't think of the other team on SmackDown, right? This, uh, the the Usos' his heels has been great. You let all those teams get, do what they do, you have a monster tie division. And, it, and uh, on both shows, or on one show, or whatever they want to do with that, it, it could be really fun and, and great to, to watch. And... I think that's what mm-hmm. you want. You want people to be invested in tag team wrestling, and they're showing the tag team wrestling you can definitely get in- invested in. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge disservice here in the brand split to both. I think to divisions that were really starting to come up in NXT as far as the women and the tag go, and and now that they're broken up, you can't. You have to wait and have all these great matches. I mean, because if you had the tag division or the women's division all together, they, they, you know, Lord knows where we would be right now. But it's certainly the match pairings infinitely amazing all the way across the board yeah definitely so lots of I mean, great stuff when it comes to them and you know of course you know we'll be covering them uh, you know in the future and hopefully you know whatever that future is it's bright that's what we want uh all right guys well there's only one thing left to do with nxt takeover toronto and that is rate this entire show and boy i mean we talked a lot of good things about this show i'm really curious what you guys rated sean what was your rating god there was nothing bad on this show at all 
And I mean, you're talking about uh, what? Uh, two and a half to two and a three quarter star match is your quote unquote worst match on the show. Uh, it, that's if you're writing it that low. Um, God, I, I think you got to give it a a nine. You got a five star match in there. You got a four star match in there. You got another one that's possibly four star match in there, depending on if you really liked it that much. I mean, it's amazing how when you think the NXT uh, performance level is not going to be high because they don't have the stars they used to have or or whatever, here they go again, just absolutely killing it. And these you can say what you want about NXT, the TV show, but NXT TakeOver, the, the events are just amazing. And they continue to do it again. I, I don't think I can say it any better. I got the same rating as Sean. This one's a nine. I just, this is absolutely incredible. Right up there with, uh, with NXT R Evolution. Just top-notch wrestling show, bell to bell, opening credits to, to when they sign off. They're, you won't find... I, this might be the best show of the year. And there, we've watched a lot of terrific shows this year. But this is certainly right up there for show of the year. You guys gave a nine for this show, and I so much I think that you know you guys are not far from wrong, but I think there's got to be a little bit of a difference uh, here. So, uh, and and really, why I say this is because I think with excellent matches, everything involved, you have got to say. I mean, it, it, it was one of the best shows. Like Paul just got through saying. I think I'll have to go with an 8 just because of the fact that and no matter how good the show was, I think still the production level, I think they still could have had even bigger interests from the other guys maybe on this show. I think they had solid matches all the way around, but I don't know. I, I don't know if I'll ever rate anything a 10. And I already have my prerequisites, and they'll never take place. And 9 is a perfect show. This was a good show, a great show. It was the best I've ever seen, or the, one of the best that I just can't get out of memory. I don't know, and I think I, you know, did uh, NXT Takeover Dallas a pretty high rating, seven or eight. So I think it's right there and really good. I'm just going to go eight though. Why not? Uh, all right. Well, that is our NXT Takeover Toronto uh, review. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, but now we're going to jump into another review. We're going to talk Survivor Series 2016 and lots of great content to talk about with that one. So we will be right back with that next, guys. All right, now here we go. Uh, I'm going to kind of do this one like we did in NXT TakeOver Toronto. We're going to kind of flip through a few of these matches. We're not going to go in order, uh, but we are going to start with the one of the biggest matches of the night first, and we're going to talk about that big Survivor Series matches between the men. And uh, these are all pretty main, you know, main event guys, all guys who have held titles or guys that are probably future title holders. Uh, But we had the Raw team and the SmackDown team face off, and we had lots of different storylines in this battle uh, of men. We had, of course, you know, a a tease of Kevin Owens using the uh, Jericho list as a weapon. Of course, the papers went everywhere. Uh, That led to both those guys' eliminations. We also had a situation where the Shield got back together, if nothing else, for at least five minutes uh, when we had Dean Ambrose and, of course, Seth Rollins and Roman Reigns all working together. We also had some other big moments that were a part of this. Well, like, you know, kind of like uh, when you want to talk about Bray Wyatt trying to convince Braun Strowman that, hey, you know, listen to me. And we actually got a tease that maybe Braun Strowman may listen. At the end of the day, all these storylines all concur and all work. But we have the final elimination start taking place. Uh, Of course, we do have a situation where Roman Reigns is the sole survivor for the Raw team, but we have Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt there for the uh, last guys for SmackDown. And Randy Orton bites the dust with a Roman Reigns spear that was meant for Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt takes advantage of this. Sister Abigail, one, two, three, 
Team SmackDown Live wins the Men's Survivor Series team. I'm really kind of curious how you thought about this overall. I'll let you guys kind of talk about your spots. We're talking about the wrong spear here because Shane McMahon was legit concussed on that other spear. So, oh, yes. And you, well, you could you see it immediately. Mm-hmm. Immediately his eyes were glazed. Uh, yes, he got up and scratched his head and whatever, but he he looked out of it. Yeah. And uh, The lights were on. Nobody was home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there was some big impact on that. I mean, look, that this match, my God, it felt like it went on forever, uh, for one. It just This is why I wish WWE would stop doing these. Why would you commit to a four-hour show? It doesn't even go four hours. It goes three and a half. And then you're obviously trying to kill time in this match. And it's like, do you not understand that it hurts the match? Like... We're not, this wasn't Iron Man rules here in this elimination match or whatever. Nobody really wanted this thing to go almost an hour. Like just, you could have just had the match and probably killed about 10, 15 minutes of it here. I, I don't know. I just, this felt like, by the time it was over, I was like, thank God. Just thank God. And thank God that SmackDown won because I thought for a minute there they were just going to pulverize SmackDown completely. Uh, it was totally surprising that Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton won. So perhaps they're going. Perhaps this is going to be longer than we thought. This is not an immediate Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt like turn on each other thing. Um, you did have some good moments in here. Just I don't know. I was just blinded by the fact that this took 53 freaking minutes. I'm kind of on the flip side of that argument. I really enjoyed this match. Actually, I thought. It was- this this and the other two Survivor Series matches I thought were some of the better ones in recent memory. Uh, this one maybe not as good as the tag match one, but certainly still quite good. I thought uh, it was well played out, and it played well off of all the feuds going on in this and all the cross stuff that you could do I thought worked out well, too. Uh, but like I was expecting Reigns to be the last one and sort of win it all for SmackDown, especially there when it got down to the last three or four guys. It really looked like it was going to be Roman just standing tall at the end as a sole survivor. And they go the other way and don't pull the other trigger and let Randy sort of solidify his spot within the Wyatt family by taking a, a taking a big spear for, for Bray, which leads to them winning. So I thought that was all really good. And uh, I, think I have a bit of a problem with what they did with Dean as far as doing the little shield reunion. I figured it was coming. And we know that Dean, obviously, is a loose cannon, plays by his own rules, bada, bada, bada. And he just really wants to get at AJ. And, I, and that there's no problem with that there. But it's, brand loyalty, at the end of the day, is supposed to be playing into this. And, and, you know, maybe just Dean isn't the type of guy who's ever going to give a shit about what brand he's on. And that's that's okay, too. Because that's sort of what makes Dean so great. But it, feel, it, it just kind of bugged me at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah, it bugged me, too. Because, like, Rollins never had a thing with where he ever ran against Roman and... Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it was it was just kind of like, okay, well, I get that we're playing on the fact that Ambrose just wants to kill AJ, and that's fine. But, yeah, just, you know. And I, I agree with you in that the all three Survivor Series matches were good. I just would have been fine if they saved some time off of this one. And I'm not saying at all that this was bad. It was not at all. It felt like a main event match. It got the the time of a main event match. It got the time to flesh out all the stories. Uh, they played to the crowd well with some of the, you know, with the Jericho stuff and the, the list, the Kevin Owens throwing the list out and being disqualified and all that stuff for it. Like, just that was, that was great stuff. I mean, so, I, I you know, it just kind of, le- for me, it just was like, I know what we're doing here, and I, uh, let's get on with it. Mm. Well, I mean, I guess and that's Maybe it's too. also because I had watched the, the whole freaking pre-show and everything else, dude. Oh, okay. I, uh, I was at Wrestle Circus, so I came into the show late. This is actually the first one I saw, so maybe that had some, some coloring to do with it. Yeah. I mean, and in those matches, I don't know that we even need to talk about. I don't know if you were going to mention them, Gary, but it's just like those two pre-show matches just felt like the biggest amount of filler. Yeah, they are. (laughs) But 
Yeah, you know, I get why they had, of course, you know, you had Kane versus, uh, I mean, forgot. Uh, Kane uh, still wins in 2016, guys. Why is Kane still winning these? <laughs> oh, my God. He beat Luke Harper, Gary, and yes, it was Luke depressing. Harper. It was depressing because you have a guy who is such a great worker and really could have used the rub of a big win here, and they just took a dump all over that, much like they took a dump over a lot of other decisions they made tonight. Oh, yeah. that was good. Like, the match actually wasn't bad mm-hmm. for once with a came, But, like, it was just like, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, you're right. And, of course, they did give love to, you know, of course, to the Cruiserweight division early and they now set a six-man tag. Uh, so that doesn't really matter, though, either. What does matter is they did have a major match for the Cruiserweight Championship and the entire Cruiserweight division on this car with Brian Kendrick would face Kalisto. And, you know, this was a match I'm really interested in hearing what you guys have to say and what you really think about it. I, it was okay, uh, in my personal opinion. But, it, you know, really, it didn't end the way it needed to end. It ended with Baron Corbin attacking Kalisto. And guess what? Disqualification. Kendrick walks away with the division and his title. B, B, B. Oh, you hear that? That's the uh, big sewage dump truck that uh, WWE took on this match when uh, Baron Corbin decided to insert himself uh, and and cost Kalisto the ability to take the cruiserweight to SmackDown. Look, I know they addressed it with Brian in a backstage segment. Uh, here's my, the thing. Kalisto still cuts the same freaking promo that he cuts... Since he's been in the damn company, people are not really going to get invested in this. Maybe they boo Corbin out of it, but it's like, uh, don't even give Kalisto a legit shot at beating uh, Kendrick. The match actually was getting really good at that point, too. Mm -hmm. And just, ugh. You know, we talked about it during Raw that perhaps it's about Raw is the bigger show, and yes, they technically do need that time. But SmackDown would use them so much better, and they could do cliffhanger endings here and there if they want to into the 205 Live show and and whatever else. It's just, uh Just, uh Yeah, uh, I... I don't know if I can expunge as much hatred as Sean just expressed, but man, uh, this this really does suck. Because, like you said, the match was getting to the part where it was about to get really good, and they had done a good job working all the way up to that. Kalisto hits a freaking Spanish fly off the apron to the floor on Kendrick, which was awesome. I think he had a lot of good work from Kendrick here, too, sort of playing into... He's still scrappy. He's still trying to hold on to that belt. He's still trying to prove that he can hang with these guys. And uh, Kalisto oftentimes would find a way to outstep him and, and keep going ahead, too. And then you have Baron Corbin come in and just sort of ruin it all. And, I mean, if that doesn't make you hate the guy, I don't know what will. Because <laughs> he just uh, he helped WWE take a dump all over this, this great idea they could have to move the Cruiserweights to SmackDown. I mean, it just it seemed like an idea to make all the sense in the world. And they just throw it out the window. Yep, yeah, exactly right. And, you know, uh, not the way any of us had imagined it going, but that's the way that they took it, and, you know, it's not good. Also, at the point that they did this, too, it meant that Raw wins the entire evening without giving the last match an opportunity to matter as far as the overall standings with the two brands. But, you know, WWE doesn't care about that either, there may not be any kind of people actually sort of rooting for one brand or the other. Isn't this the whole point of that? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a small thing I, in the whole, you know, what we're talking about here. But it's just like, if you're going to set this up as five Raw versus SmackDown matches, why would you not set it up to where the final one, whatever that one is, makes it to where... Either brand could win instead of, oh, well, Raw already sewed it up. Who cares as far as who wins the last one? Yeah, I mean, 
to me, and doing a sort of no finish like this too really sticks in my craw. Uh, especially, I mean, yeah, Kendrick winning I think would have helped him a lot more than this sort of tainted thing to help a feud along that really hasn't had any legs from the get go. And also, uh, and so also, I, what what the hell are the GMs doing? Are they just wiping their ass in the back? Like they can't come out and restart the match? They they can't do anything? Like are they just powerless throughout this entire show? Like I know Shane was getting ready for a match, but like you got three other GMs here. Maybe uh, maybe D Bry was too busy making sure Nikki was still okay three hours into the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agreed. This is interesting uh, because of those facts. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, it sucks the way it all worked out. I, I kind of hate this because I think we all wanted to see SmackDown get the Cruiserweights because of 205 Live. Just not working out that way. Uh, let's move on, though, guys. We have another big, important match here. We have the Survivor Series tag team match to take place and you know there's lots involved lots of different eliminations i'll let you guys kind of talk about what you find most important and win these uh eliminations uh but we do have team raw winning with uh sheamus and cesaro helping that team win this big bout against the uh, i think the usos were the last uh competitor for smackdown so there you go what do you think sean this was my favorite one this was my favorite Survivor Series match. This was the most well done Survivor Series match as far as everything that was put into it for me. Uh, the American Alpha, get the freaking uh, Jordan just launching uh, Gable in, into. The, oh, he almost missed everybody. That's how far he launched him. Uh, New Day getting eliminated immediately was a total shock. And then, of course, you know, uh, Gary's favorite policeman getting eliminated, like, in seconds was hilarious. And, uh, you know, just, th- this was just so well done, great stuff. The Usos actually be- being the, the final team was a bit surprising. Uh, but, I mean, Cesaro and Sheamus looked great in this. Freaking Gallus and Anderson looked really good in this, too. I mean, just... Everybody had a moment to, to shine, except for the obviously the ones that got eliminated really early. But just you let some teams with New Day get eliminated, you let some other teams share that light, and I think everybody benefited here for that. And I think the the crowd was really into this by the end. And considering how they've been about the tag teams on both of these shows, it says a lot. And the crowd just really wanted Heath Slater too. That was that was that was awesome. They uh, they really did just want Heath Slater, and that was great. I think all the teams really got, I mean, unless you got eliminated early like Rizongo or The New Day, I think everybody else really got some time to shine, and that's that's what I really appreciated out of this. The Usos, I think, look great. American Alpha put on a stellar performance, too, as, as Sean mentioned. The, the sort of belly-to-belly, throw-over-my-head, super-launcher death ball that became Chad Gable by Jason Jordan was an awesome... Um, I love that they got an elimination, too, off the elevated Bulldog. I can't help. They continue to look like the Steiner Brothers to me, and I love it. Um, I, everything else about this was just really great. It, it got chaotic at times, but I think that's part of its charm. Is it, It's just this sort of wacky, over-the-top, you know, 20-guy tag team match. And I think it, what it did well, it did really well. And I, I, just, I don't think you could speak highly enough about how well these guys did. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, and we had some tag teams here that we kind of felt like we're going to go further, lose earlier, uh, American Alpha being one of them. So, you know, it, it kind of had this nice, refreshing feel because of the fact that you didn't have the same old guys at the end of the, the bout, you know, the tag team champions. Like the New Day, uh, they lost early, so they were out pretty quick. Uh, so let's move on, though. Uh, we have another interesting match on this card. The Miz and Sami Zayn were going at it for the Intercontinental title. And boy, uh, once again, controversial fashion when it comes to the Miz. He uh, has his wife, Maurice, out the side of the ring, and she decides to ring the bell, which makes Sami Zayn feel like that he just won the match, but he did not. And that, of course, gave Miz the chance to roll him up and one, two, three. 
the Intercontinental title stays with SmackDown. And, you know, I, I thought this match was good for what it was worth. I kind of in, really enjoyed it. I like both these guys. How did you feel at the end of the day, Paul? Uh, I really hated that we had to be reminded that the Montreal Screwjob is still a thing. Uh, because, God, we can't let that finish die ever. But the match, I think, was fine for what we were given. I was a little disappointed once uh, you know, they went with the finish that they did. But everything else I thought was great. The Miz sort of working the leg was awesome. Uh, sort of having Sami Zayn trying to play the plucky underdog again it is always going to work. And I, I don't know. Like The decision to keep the belt on the Miz, I guess, it, it is okay. I really would have preferred this to give Sami some juice. But they seem dead set against doing that. So I don't know where you go with Sammy from here. But the Miz, you know, is he going to go back to feuding with Dolph? What, what's going to happen over on SmackDown? Obviously, that's still a big question for this one. But, man, I really hated this finish. Yeah, I hated this finish, too. It's like, oh, my God, really? Like, really, Vince? You just can't let this thing go. Like, oh, we're in Canada, guys. We gotta do the screw job. Like, we just have to do the screw job. Like, nah, man. It's, you can just not do it. Right? You can, <laughs> you can just decide that you're not gonna do it, and we can just let it go for a year, or whatever. Just, Miz did great leg work in this this match, mm-hmm. though. We should commend him for that, because normally he did the figure four, and it just, you just he never works a leg. So, uh, I, I would say that. Termin- I obviously Miz took a page out of Samoa Joe's book on on the previous night, so that's that's good that you know Miz is paying attention. He saw the Daniel Bryan stuff, which again works in, into that favor. And look, uh, I think this works for that story they're telling with him and Bryan and the SmackDown thing. That's great, um, especially because this this also hurt because this was the first one they didn't they did the cruiserweight match after this. Mm-hmm. So you're you're thinking, okay, well, that's weird. Um, but maybe if maybe SmackDown is going to win the two singles matches, and then Raw is just going to win all the Survivor Series matches. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it was still a pretty good match. Just it's one of those like, God, this company, like, stop being so petty. Stop. Yeah, I know. It, it was just kind of a bummer because I really thought it would be fun to have Sami Zayn win the Intercontinental title. I get, though, why The Miz holds it. The Miz is a guy that, you know, can sit around and just proclaim his greatness and do all those things with the Intercontinental title around his waist, around his arm. He can be that just ultimate heel on SmackDown. But, man, it's just it was not the way we wanted it to work out. So I think that makes it even worse at the end of the day. But, you know, there you go. Uh, Let's talk about another Survivor Series match with the women in this one, actually. And this one, you know, has a lot involved. We'll actually uh, start this one out with the SmackDown uh, team actually losing a member before they actually got to start the match. And that is Nikki Bella. She actually had some kind of situation backstage and uh, she is hurting. Her head got hit. She doesn't know who hit her. But she cannot continue the ma- uh, to come to the ring because, well, the doctor won't let her. So Natalia offers her services as the coach. And Daniel Bryan has no way around it. He has to let her do it. So uh, Natalia actually joins the fray. And this get- match gets underway. Uh, we have, of course, a big brawl for a little while there. Uh, lots of interesting things take place. To kind of fast forward to the end here, though, uh, we have, of course, Bailey. And Charlotte for the Raw team facing off against, uh, we have Becky Lynch and Alexa Bliss. And Alexa Bliss and Becky Lynch, of course, begin to argue, fight. That causes the downfall for Alexa Bliss. Becky Lynch goes one-on-one with uh, Bailey, with Charlotte still being active in this match. Bailey to uh, Bailey. To Bailey. One, two, three. Becky Lynch loses, and Bailey wins it for Team Raw. That's not the end of the story, though. After this, Charlotte attacks Bailey, and that's how this whole thing ends, with Charlotte walking away, but she beats up her own team member who won the uh, match for Raw. Paul, I mean, I don't know how you felt about it. I didn't think it was a bad match, but it was kind of chaotic at times. Yeah, it was kind of chaotic at times, but for me, what I really liked about all of this was coming out of this, 
I think this Survivor Series match did the best as far as interacting all the feuds together. Uh, everybody who had a problem got their story played off of. Even Carmella, who, you know, I think it's obvious that Natalia attacked Nikki to get into the match now because that was something she really wanted to do. And it, it certainly pays off because that pop she got whenever she came out was loud as sin. But I love how everybody's looking at Carmella like, you did this, didn't you? She's like, no, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. And I, I, I think I tend to believe her just because it helps feed into that idea that everybody on SmackDown in the women's division has something going for them. That's not saying Natalia didn't, but now you're sort of tying up people in different feuds, and I think it works out very well. Bailey and Charlotte get some play here. I think Bailey gets to look even better, not only pinning the SmackDown Women Champion, but this is the same Becky uh, earlier in the match got to made Nia Jax tap out to the freaking Disarmor, which I got to pop out of me. And uh, I think throughout this match, too, Becky really proved that she might be the best woman in, in either division. Not only was she on point in this match, but I think by far she did the best job of getting the crowd behind her. And maybe it's because she already has so much of the crowd behind her, but I think if there were any doubters out there, she certainly silenced them as to what she can do and just look phenomenal. Uh, I totally agree, and I've been saying this for a while, that Becky Lynch should be getting uh, much more uh, play than – or much more uh, – credit than she, than she gets for possibly being the sort of underrated one of of the th- the three you know that have been on raw the long or that have been on the main roster the longest uh just because you know she really obviously charlotte is a great heel and they've done a great job booking her to be that way and she's gotten pretty good at the promo she did really good on raw by the way i thought uh playing with the with the canadians and everything but, like, Becky doesn't need to sit there and have these big promos to do that. She just goes out there. The time she does talk, she uses it well. But she goes out there in her matches, and she gets you behind her. And they picked the perfect person to ha- have that solo role. And I thought perhaps Becky would overcome the odds. And they didn't do that on this show um, at all. They didn't do that with any of the three stars, which was weird because that's always – a story they tend to tell in one of these things, and they didn't do it with any of them. Um, but uh, you know, having Bailey and Charlotte stand tall and have Charlotte beat up Bailey, I think works. You're still trying to get Bailey over. You already know where Becky is. She's a champ for a reason. Uh, you didn't need to add any more, and you already had the thing with her and Alexa during the match too. So I'm fine with what they decided to do for the win and the finish and everything. But this match was pretty good. I mean, Naomi looked really good here, uh, you know, doing her crossbody to the outside and, and all that, uh, you know, uh, Natty didn't get to do a whole lot, but, uh, Nia looked like the monster and, uh, you know, you got what you, you needed out of this for the, for the first, first match of the night. Yeah. You're right. And, uh, you know, once again, I mean, this one kind of was fun because of the fact you did have all the storylines and you had a a lot going on. And I kind of like the idea of, you know, continuing something even after the matches won, you know, continue this thing with Charlotte, you know, basically saying I'm better than everyone. And I didn't even have to win the match, but I I, am going to walk away and not leave one other person standing. So that was good stuff, if you ask me. Uh, well, I totally wish we could rate this show before we talk about this next match. I think it'd get a higher rating, probably. But we're going to talk about it, uh, even though I, I, I'd love to avoid it. Let's talk about Brock Lesnar facing off against Bill Goldberg. This is the second time that these guys will have a match. And, of course, you know, the all-popular, terrible match they had the first time did not lead to very many good thoughts. But here we are. And, jeez, Goldberg wins two spears and a jackhammer. That's all it took, guys. That's it. One, two, three. Goldberg barely breaks a sweat here. Um, Sean, how excited were you? I'm, I'm, I'm going with you first because I know Paul has a rant and rave coming our way. <laughs> I, you know, uh, and if you listen to this with the Raw show first, you might have heard a little bit of us interacting here, but... I'm going to be honest in that 
I'm live tweeting during this. I'm also doing a Ravel where we're sort of trying to do commentary. And it is absolutely... I mean, we're not doing kayfabe commentary. Let me, I'll just be honest about that. Uh, we're, I'm kind of analyzing, and he's sort of trying to be the play-by-play person. Uh, and it, this is absolute shock. Like, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm like, I did the whole... Kurt Gibson from the Dodgers 1988 series. Like, I don't believe what I just saw. Like, the hell. Like, the, this is not what anybody expected. None of us expected this at all. Um, and uh, it, WWE delivered a true, genuine surprise. We may not care for it. We may not think it's the best thing ever. It doesn't help WWE in the long term at all. But for... Getting this, like, just, oh my god, wow, you got that, you got that, and and let's be honest here, did you really want them to go 20 minutes? I know some people were complaining about the time, or whatever, but it's like, why? Did you really want them to go 20 minutes? Like, you know, just, if they would have gone 10 minutes, you could have wound up a WrestleMania 20 all over again, just... This is probably for the better, and I think let's unless they're gonna just unless that's what it was, and maybe this is a punishment for Brock. You gotta think a rematch is coming. So, I mean, again, WWE could decide if if uh, you know Goldberg is crazy hot leading into Royal Rumble. Maybe they decide to just switch everything. But you have to think every match is coming. All right. All that that Sean just said, taken into account. Are you freaking kidding me with this shit? This is this is ridiculous, okay? The heat for the streak is dead. And yeah, you could say maybe they should have done something earlier with Brock where he finally took the law somewhere. Because that seems to be the whole point behind a beating taker was so they had somebody younger and somebody just as well built so that the heat of the streak and this big rub could go to somebody else. And they give it to freaking Goldberg in 2016, a 49-year-old man who goes two minutes with him. Yeah, match length, I don't want 20 minutes. I barely wanted 10. But to make Brock look like this and give it all to Goldberg, it's just, it's a crock of shit. This is this is so dumb. This is the worst move WWE has made in a long time. They've shot themselves on the foot. There's no heat left on Brock now. You, you've thrown that away. And unless Goldberg's sticking around to do the job for somebody else, and I don't think he is, and I don't think that was ever in the cards, this has all just been a giant fucking waste of time, and I hate myself for watching this. Dumb. Like, this is so funny, like, because... Now, granted, part of that is because The Rock was became a much bigger movie star than they ever imagined in 2003. But, like, it's amazing how different the world is where when Bill Goldberg was there for an entire year, they wouldn't do this with Bill Goldberg. But mm-hmm. he's here for... Probably three days, you know, three dates that we know of, and then I'm sure he's got some other ones that he'll do in the lead up to World War and lead up to WrestleMania. And you're you book him like Goldberg from WCW, like the hell, <laughs> like this is just out of nowhere. I mean, I'm glad that Vince is reading the crowd reaction and and. And I think this is what this is. I think if we we look at this from a from a let's take out the because WWE doesn't think long term anymore. They don't book. They firmly believe that John Cena was the last guy. And if it's not Roman Reigns, then fuck it, we're not gonna book anybody else uh, that that high. Of John Cena was the last guy that he is above the brand. The brand is the star. The brand is the the WWE is what you go see. You don't go see this guy or that guy or that woman or this woman or whatever. You go see WWE. That's what they want you uh, to do because Vince is scared to high holy hell that I guess that some of these guys will go somewhere. Where? Where the hell are they going to go? Nowhere. 
I mean, like, okay, yeah, Cesaro might go to Japan and be awesome or something, but, like, let's be honest. Like, they go to ROH or TNA or whatever. Are they really going to become these huge megastars? No. Like, there's nowhere for them to go. So, like, why are you so scared for somebody to be above your brand or become big or, you know, even, like, Daniel Bryan level? Like, why are you scared for that to happen to you? Yes, Daniel Bryan got a career-ending injury, and and you, your company suffered for it because he could have given you, you know, had that not happened, who knows how many years he would have been able to give you as far as selling merchandise and doing all this. And let's be honest, he probably doesn't sell as much being a GM now and, and all that stuff if he even – I don't know that he really has merch at this point, but like – you know, it, the thing is, you have guys that you can build around, but WWE thinks in, okay, how can we get to WrestleMania, and what's going to now sell Royal Rumble, because you have 60,000 people you got to fit in the Alamo Dome. What's going to get people to sell out the Alamo Dome and sell out WrestleMania at, at the Citrus Bowl? Oh, people are really reacting to Goldberg. Let's just go with it. Fuck it. Let's go with it. And and that's, I think, what he is thinking. He is not thinking about, oh, well, we built up Brock and, we, and somebody else needs to beat him. Or and Let's be honest, fuck. We, they could have just had Roman beat him again. And and then it, it still means nothing because I don't care what somebody says. I'm going to stand by this. And there's other people that have said this too. Roman Reigns is going to be Randy Orton too. That's all he's ever going to be, whether he turns heel or not. That's all he is ever going to be. He is not going to be John Cena level. So that mm-hmm. means you need to find somebody else that's going to fill that role. And they don't want to do that right now. So I don't know. I, I You got to give Vince a little bit of credit to listening to people. But it's just like. Of all the times to listen to people, every other time you, you should listen to people you don't. But you do it with Goldberg, and it's just like, you know at WrestleMania, you can't do that, right? Unless you're going to hide him in the middle of the card. Like, you can't do this because it, it's going to look bad. You you only can hide his deficiencies so long. Mm-hmm. Here's the thing. Even if you're only looking from WrestleMania to WrestleMania, that is still long-term brooking. You are looking a year out and ahead. And at this stage in the game, I think that's as far as WWE is ever as far as willing to look, as you said. But that being said, if you get from one WrestleMania to the next WrestleMania to the next WrestleMania, because I'm sure that's how the streak ended up for The Undertaker, was that he just sort of lucked into it, and they happened to have a freaking gold miner in their hands by the time he got to, you know, 15 or 16 or whatever freaking number they actually started caring about the count. When you have Brock Lesnar not get pinned... Not get submitted. He only happens to be in a match where he loses because there's another guy or something else for almost four goddamn years. And he is this big monster and has looked damn near invincible every single time you send him out. And you have him lose to freaking Goldberg in two minutes. Unacceptable. Unacceptable in wrestling terms because this guy has all the freaking heat. And to get it to the next guy, you have to give it to somebody who you're willing to go all in with. And just because Roman Reigns shat the bed on you and we didn't get on board because we didn't like you shoving him down our throats doesn't mean you back off. You go to the next project. The next project seemingly this year was Dean Ambrose and they shot the bed on that again at WrestleMania. They fucked it all up because they can't for the life of them decide what the hell they want to do. Every time they're presented with an opportunity to make somebody to do something right by another guy who is coming by, up the well, ladder. By Dean's words, that wasn't Vince. That was Brock just saying, fuck it. I got UFC. Um, we're not doing this. I don't give a shit. You make him go out there and take a loss in two minutes like this, then, just to somebody who actually is going to be there the next day. Oh, but hold on. Didn't we, but to be fair, didn't we say this when Undertaker lost the street to Brock, though? That it should have been somebody else, that it should have been somebody younger, that it should have, you know, like... I, I don't know if I was this pissed when he dropped the streak. Well, I mean, Brock makes sense because he, that you with the streak, you got to think about mm-hmm. somebody that can actually carry the load of... Exactly. Of living and I up think to that's it. Where right. And it's been a while since we talked about that, but I don't recall being this upset about it because, as we you know, at the time, Brock, 
was being built up into, into the monster that we know him to be right now. He would go from there to win the title, to holding on to the title, to losing by a fluke, right? And, and right. at that same, I mean, I'll give you that because I, like I said, I don't remember how pissed I was there because I, I don't. In my memory, I don't recall being as upset about the streak dropping. I remember being as surprised, but I don't remember being this pissed. I was freaking livid when they were going off the air. Like, and this is the, like it might have been the most I posted in a, in a freaking topic on our Facebook page too, because people were were talking about all their different problems with it and and, and whatever. But I, I mean, we lo- we're looking at a company who continues to make the wrong decision at the wrong time and not do right by its younger stars. And the only reason you can even say that Kevin Owens and AJ have gotten as far as they are is because you have guys like us who continue to watch these shows and are the continuing basis. And whenever they get backed into a corner, they go with the guy who's been around for a while that we all have already got behind because he was there before this. That's the only reason. So any other time, like I have absolutely zero faith that they're going to make another mega star. And then even if it's not John Cena, even if it's not somebody I'm super into, like, I mean, even somebody else comes along and they shove him down our throats and he happens to gain traction, then that's great. The company needs another big star. But come the fuck on. You're not going to do it making decisions like this. No. Just no. Yeah, you're exactly right. No. And yeah, yeah, I rant over. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean good stuff, guys. I mean it really is, and you know. But you're I, a Goldberg. You're a big Goldberg fan, Gary. So I mean, like for you, th- that's got this. That had to be totally surprising, right? Like it, it was very surprising, and I came into this like we all did, thinking you know it's going to be you know Goldberg getting in the ring. Showing his kid, this is what I do. This is what I did for a long time. You know, look, I'm still a hero. He loses the match either very violently and is bleeding in front of his kid to set up a future feud, or he loses. And then he gets up, waves at the crowd, goes over there and kisses his kid on the head. And there you go. There's Goldberg's career. It's over. No, they had to have this happen. And I just... As much of a Goldberg as I so was, so did you? Uh, do you like uh, shirtless his shirtless son in there too? I'm, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get to that. Trust me. <laughs> uh, so Goldberg, in the end, does win in convincing, dominating fashion. I thought that was terrible, only because you know I wanted to see something more than that. Not that I wanted to. You know, I don't want to definitely see a long match, but I just was looking forward to some MMA stuff. You know, a few things mixed in here and nothing, nothing at all. Brock Lesnar should have never lost like that. I mean, this guy's long term. Goldberg's not. You, Paul's already ranted, so I don't need to do it. But my point in all this is, is it was a parade afterwards. It was just a little parade. And the kid with his shirt off was very creepy. I uh, didn't appreciate it. But oh well, um, he could have, you know, his wife is there, you know, wrong person. Um, what? So anyway. Hold on, what? are you trying to say his wife needed to go topless? Well, that'd have been better than the kid. I mean, why <laughs> okay. don't we do that? I mean, come on. Anyway, what, what was the purpose in that? Tell me, what was the purpose in the shirt? I don't kid? know. It's, I, the kid got too emotional. Fuck, who knows? He ripped his shirt off? My God. Yeah, he was trying <laughs> to channel Hulk Hogan, you know? It's... He was trying to be like his dad. I'm sorry, kid. You're, you're not set yeah. like your dad. I mean, I, I, you know. I, it's a feel- so, hold on. So, if, so, will it be better or any better or any wor- or worse if they... Don't do a rematch. Does it make it? Is there anything salvaged by? Okay, we didn't want to give it all away right now, knowing that we're going to do a rematch at WrestleMania. I uh, even I don't think a rematch at WrestleMania does anybody any favors. Even if Brock wins again, there's no point anymore. I think to to keeping to keeping Brock around, and maybe if that's the point. Then and and you're going to call everything that you did with him up to this point a wash. And that's that's a pretty serious offense than whatever. But at that same time, like I 
I have zero interest in another match going forward. This has killed any interest for me in Brock. This It's killed interest for me in Goldberg. I, I don't care. Yeah. So, I feel so your Goldberg pain. has now reached rock levels of I don't care. from Exactly. Oh. I'm done with The Rock. I'm done with part-timers. John Cena, get the fuck out of the building, too. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, at least John Cena puts people over. Man. I'm done. I'm done with part-timers. If you're not here full-time, if you're not committed, you're only going to let WWE make bad choices at every turn. I, I would agree. The only thing I will say is, you know, they've still got to find guys that are going to draw, and yes, they need to build those guys. Uh, but they've also got to make sure that they keep people's interest to build those guys too. And that's the reason the part-timers are valuable, whether they take those big spots that they shouldn't take or not. Okay, but when they, they don't build anyone, what the hell are they doing? Yeah. I did, well, it makes me curious that if Hulk Hogan had never left in, in the 90s, would we have ever gotten anything that we've gotten out of WWF since then? Or would have Hulk Hogan been like 20 million time world champion at this point? Vince very clearly cannot help himself <laughs> when he's got big name guys around. He just can't help himself. Yeah, Sam, well, we still I'm... don't even know what the Undertaker is going to do, and he's at least Undertaker has come out and kind of said, "Okay, well, I'm gonna if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna be." I, I don't know. Maybe he's not going to be on TLC at all, but we don't know. You know, uh, I want to go. Could, I could Get easily out, see. Higher. So, so I mean, but, like, the thing is, like, we could get Taker and Ambrose out of that or something. I'm done. I mean. Get him out of the building. Part-timer. No. I get back <laughs> yeah. to go. I'm done. Oh, man. Well, there you go. Thanks a lot. Uh, I don't care. Know, I'm not going to say no to Undertaker and Dean Ambrose. I don't care. I'm just saying thanks a lot. To, uh... oh, what's the point? <laughs> See, see, see what you did, Brock Goldberg. You broke see what it. you guys did. You, yeah, you broke see, but I think Undertaker would give Dean Ambrose a heck of a lot more than when Brock did. I'm I, going broken. Know, I, I'm going broken. Matt Hardy on him, guys. I'm done. I'm just, okay. I'm out in the okay. woods. I'm He's, setting weird crosses on fire. I got to pull a resurrection somewhere. I got to dye my yeah. hair now. I got to throw it up. This broke is gonna God. be hot. <laughs> uh, I can't wait. This is going to be the most exciting Where's time. Where's that lake I... of reincarnation? We got to throw Paul in there. I know, right? <laughs> oh man, I can't. When he gets his Vanguard one for Christmas, I'm going to be thrilled. Are y'all? I mean, are y'all ready for the Jeff Hardy return on on Thanksgiving? Oh, I mean, we're just that's how I'm oh, going to celebrate my Thanksgiving. Forget the football. It's... Oh my God, Jeff Hardy's back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oof. Uh, but anyway, guys, well, that wraps up our conversation about Survivor Series, and uh, we have to pretty much do one last thing for it, and that is give it a rating. So let's do this thing, uh, Paul. Uh, how did you feel like this whole entire card, what it deserved? Uh, I, I'm so torn. Uh, the, the, uh, the workers and everybody, they were they did great. There's a lot of good matches on here. There's a lot of questionable booking decisions. There's a big, big problem at the top of the card. I I, I want to give it the Bret Hart special just because I'm so angry, but I feel like that's doing the card a disservice because they, really everybody else worked really well. I'm gonna go with a. I'm gonna go with a six. I'm gonna go with a six. Sean, I am. Uh... I feel weird because I I don't have this like disdain for what they did with with Goldberg and that they wanted to create a shock they certainly delivered on that. Uh, the rest of the matches were really good to to good. You just had some dunk like the decisions the booking decisions were just weird, right? Like that's that's what was weird about it. And so, I don't know. I feel like I, I feel like a six and a half, seven, and six, I'll, I'll settle on the six and a half. I'll settle on the six and a half. But like, yeah, I mean, there's certainly matches. To, I mean, none of the matches except for the main. I mean, the main event's not even long enough to where it really matters. Uh, when you actually watch the the six matches that are on this actual card. They're all actually pretty good, 
And then you have the ending that's kind of like, uh, all right, okay, well, that was something. And then, yeah, so just wish they'd make better decisions. That's it. Yeah, I think we can all agree on that. I'm going to go with a six as well. Uh, I think, you know, they had some very interesting spots. I think they had some matches that definitely were of quality. Uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, um, it just wasn't over as well as it needed to be. And I think that there are some situations that WWE needs to clean up or maybe figure out what they want to do in the future. Um, after we kind of talk this thing out, it's even more evident than it was before. So very interesting stuff, guys. Well, of course, you know, we want to you know say thank you to everybody who came and checked out this show. Uh, if you want to hear more of our stuff and this is your first time listening, go to the W2M Network, wherever you get your podcast. All you got to do is hit subscribe and you get all the shows we do every time we come out. Of course, you'll always have one on the download on Tuesday mornings and Thursday. Uh, Friday mornings. Now, just a quick editorial note. This week, we are not going to be doing a Thursday show. We're going to put it off a day and do it Friday night. So that means you guys will be getting downloads on Saturday and not on Friday. So I just want to give you guys a heads up about that. And as well, of course, you know, once again, if you want to go read written reviews and go check out a bunch of great content, you need to go to W2Mnet.com. That's the place you get not only reading uh, material, but you also get, you know, podcast if you want to do it that way. So it's easier for you. Uh, but besides that, guys, that pretty much wraps us up for this special edition of wrestling to the max pay-per-view reviews uh we will see you guys on episode 222 of wrestling to the max part one until then if you're not living life to the max i'm living life at all you know it please The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment.